Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to my Total War Warhammer 2 Lore and Army video on Araby. Now, Araby, for those of you who don't know, is located to the southwest of the Badlands and the Old World in this area here. Now, to kick things off in this video, we are going to f go through a little bit of the history of Araby to give you some context of what Araby in the Warhammer world is all about. Here we have the map of Araby. As you may guess, Araby is a very dry and hot place and has a very ancient history. Its ancient times, however, are slightly slightly clouded in mystery. No one's quite sure what the ancient civilization of Araby used to be like. Some have said that it was a unified and powerful nation, one that could almost rival its neighbor, Nehekara, in power and prestige. Others have said that it's always been wandering bands of nomads. Whatever the case, it is known that ancient Araby had made very early contact with the elves and enjoyed a very healthy trading relationship with the elves from very early on in their history. There are two people who have said to have bonded over their knowledge and love of horses. So they would trade horses and, and indeed horses from modern Araby in the Warhammer world are said to be particularly quick and many assume they are descended from elven horses themselves. The first mentions of Araby in ancient times come along the area of the rebellion of Lamia when Lamia became the first uh, kingdom or province of vampires ruled over by Queen Neferata. Now to get a little bit more of that story, do click in the top right hand corner for my missing Legendary Lords Vampire Count video and you can get a bit more about the entire story of what went on there. But they went over to aid their neighbors and so it shows some cooperation between the two nations early on in ancient times. However, this changed with Nekakara becoming the land of the dead being ruled over by first Nagash and then eventually becoming the area of the Tomb Kings. By the year negative 11,049, so approximately 3,650 years before the Total War Warhammer timeline, the land of Nekakara had really become the land of the dead, more like we know it today. And a chap known as Arkan the Black was a particularly powerful ruler in the area. And he, in that year, led a crusade against the city of Bel Aliad, which was a jewel in the crown of Araby at the time. And he absolutely destroyed it. And this kicked off an era known by the people of Araby as the War of Death. And it was a period of a thousand years in which Ark and the Black led constant raids against Araby and just reaped complete devastation over their civilization as it stood at the time. Eventually, Arkan was called back to the side of his master, Nagash, for Arkan was really Nagash's right-hand guy for much of his history. So Ark and the Black decides to disappear and that ends a thousand years of just being massacred, having armies of the dead march upon your lands. And it really left Araby a broken place compared to what it used to be. They were divided and fighting city-states and a number of tribes had become homeless and had resorted to living as nomads around the area of Araby. It really said to have changed their civilization from what it used to be and left it a shadow of its former self. But after these thousand years of raids, life began to resume some sort of normalcy. And it's disputed here, but either around the year negative 50 or the year 500 of the imperial calendar, a chap known as Abdul ben Rashid decided to go around the lands of his neighbors and see what had become of them and kind of get to the source of where Ark and the Black had come from and what was going on in their kind of area they've avoided but their ancient neighbors of Nehekara and he went on a trip through the lands of the dead for eight years he went on this pilgrimage adventuring around avoiding death at every corner and he returned and he wrote a book known simply as the book of the dead now this book is the only reason anyone really knows anything about what is going on in the lands of the dead today. He wrote eight copies before he died rather suspiciously and the Sultan at the time ordered them destroyed 
but that wasn't really particularly successful, and copies have begun to circulate among the most prestigious libraries of the old world. So that's the only reason any of the outside world really knows anything about what's going on in the land of the dead. Now this next bit I'm a little bit iffy on guys because I wasn't able to find the citation source myself but I found enough places that I, I'm assuming this is actual games workshop law rather than fan made law. But around the year 1000 of the imperial calendar a chap was born known as Muhammad al Kuyat, and he was a baby that would go on to become what is known in Arabic as the prophet. Now he lived his life going on and he at some stage grew into adulthood and was wandering the desert and he comes across a temple in the middle of the desert near the Atlan mountains there which you can see in the northwest of the country of Araby. He was wandering around that area and discovered this undisturbed temple said to have been unable to be built by man and he found this wondrous temple in the middle of the desert and this was said to be a temple of Osmazd and Osmazd he went in there and read the texts of Osmazd and some have actually stipulated that Osmad might, Osmads might have actually been an old one and that Muhaid had, temp had stumbled into a house or ancient home of one of the original old ones. But he read these texts and began preaching the word of Osmazd. Now, an important element to remember about Ormazd is that Ormazd is a god who exists in the pantheon of gods of ancient Nehekara as well, being primarily the god of the sun there. But in his travels, Muhaid picked it up and has adopted him as a singular god, but still very much represents the idea of the sun. So that's where the origin of Ormazd comes from. What Muhaid had done is he started to preach that Osmand was the only one true god. And this begins to unify the areas of Araby, all the disparate tribes and disparate city-states began to unify underneath the faith of Ormazd. And it brought them together as one nation, one country, and he became the first great sultan of Araby. Now this is a bit iffy in the lore because in some of the older editions of Games Workshop stuff, the god that Araby worships is just lazily referred to as Allah. They just straight up wrote Allah in some of their older books. And the Osman thing, I assume, is a editation because I don't think you'd be putting that in your books these days necessarily. Also, it's a bit true to our real world, and I think Games Workshop just lacked a bit of imagination the day they wrote that book I saw where they just mentioned him as Allah. Monotheism it seems to be the main focus of their culture, whether Games Workshop is calling that Allah still or Ormazd. Or but that's the idea of Araby, it's unified under this one faith and that's how it drew together its national identity. Ever since then, there have been different ranks of nobles, so you do that the great sultan and you get individual sultans running their own uh, city-states really, but they kind of join together when need be under the word of the great sultan, not dissimilar to the empire really. And there's also sheikhs and emirs and other ranks that go underneath the sultan, but it essentially puts into place a traditional hierarchical model of a nation under the great sultan and under the worship of the single god. So that's the way Araby politically became the country it is now. So by the year 1150 of the imperial calendar, Araby is a much more established nation. They have become unified under their singular faith. And, you know, they begin to start building their place up in the world again and start venturing about. And they've always been consummate traders, trading with the elves, they're fantastic sailors, so they can get as far as Ind and Nippon, and really have this entire global trade network that goes through their cities. They really have explored almost everywhere. However, despite all these great explorations, one explorer and trader has become known above all, and that is Ibn Jelaba. And what Ibn did was he had heard the mystical stories of the lost city of Zlatlan. And he said, okay, I've heard of the riches, that the streets are paved with gold, as it were. I've got to go down there and see what it is. But the only problem is, what's standing in his way are the jungles of the Southlands. 
but in some way magical cunning or just through sheer force of arms he managed to go down from Araby and indeed find the lost city of Zlatlan. Now this was a lizard man city but the lizard men didn't chop him down because the slan who existed in Zlatlan had predicted his coming and so it was expected as part of the grand plan. So he was celebrated and welcomed and indeed he traded pearls and spices and left with carts and carts of gold. The lizard men don't value gold it's as common as mud to them and they got all these fun things so Ibn eventually returned to Araby probably the wealthiest man in the nation having found this long lost city that had been spoken about for many centuries in folklore and returned a stunningly rich man. Although their seamanship has allowed them to become fantastic traders and global travelers, it also allows them to be fantastic pirates as well. And out of the city of Le Chic, a tradition of corsairs and pirating began to evolve. And it wasn't long before they wanted to conquer different territories and hunt in richer waters. So a group of pirates from Araby at some point set their sights on the island of Sartosa off the coast of Tilia. So they led a fleet of corsairs out of Le Chic and they made their way to Sartosa. The Tilians, never really being one for a fight themselves, employed a mercenary force of Norsecan raiders to help them defend their island. But the Norsecans could not compete with the disciplined nature and the sworn oaths the Arabian Corsairs had made to their masters. So they had more discipline and the Norsecans were eventually defeated. So in the year 1240, Araby took control of the island of Sartosa and would hold onto it for many centuries to come, raiding around the Tilian Sea and the Black Gulf and using it as a launching point to start raiding the seas of the Old World as well. In the year 1435, so we're about a thousand years away from the current Total War Warhammer timeline, a powerful wizard out of a nomad tribe known as Jafar began to consolidate power around Araby. He started to unite tribes around him. Many of his adversaries begin to die very strange and mysterious deaths, and no one's quite sure what is going on. What happens, apparently, is that Jafar had made an alliance with the Skaven and had begun a climb to power that would see him eventually crown himself the Great Sultan and unify the entirety of Araby under his banner, which he had successfully done so by around the year 1450 of the Imperial Calendar. Following this, as his ambition and thirst for power grew, so did his paranoia in equal measure, a trait that the Skaven were quick to pounce upon, and around the year 1450, they had convinced Jafar that Estalia was plotting to invade Araby, leading Jafar to launch an invasion of Estalia itself. So he started to gather his forces to amass a huge army, the likes of which Araby had not seen before, and he launched his ships across the coast, and quickly fell upon the capital of Estalia, Magrita. Now, having never faced an external threat of this magnitude, the Estalians put up a valiant defense, but just could not compete with the sheer numbers of the army that Araby had attacked their shores with, and Magrita quickly fell. Having conquered this area, the Sultan Jafar split his forces, sending some of them by sea to Tabaro and some of them advancing by land towards Bilbali. Thinking at this stage he had seized Estalia and perhaps it would be his foothold in taking the rest of the old world, he began to suffer slightly from hubris, leading to the idea of him splitting these forces and being quite happy with it, thinking there was nothing else left to threaten him. However, paying attention to what was going on south of his borders, the king of Bretoni at the time, who was King Louis the Righteous, began to put together some forces of his own and marched them south. 
Now, the motivation of what King Louis was doing is slightly debated because while conquering all of these territories, the Sultan Jafar was amassing huge amounts of Italian slaves and sending them back to Araby to be a workforce. Now, Britonia, one could argue, was so enraged by this treatment of their neighbors, Estalia, that they marched against them, but the more practically minded simply said that King Louis the Righteous really just saw the writing on the wall, and once Estalia fell, he knew Britonia would be next, so better to take the fight to the Arabian army. Now, King Louis the Rash is said to have gone two ways here. The, the law slightly varies, but he was either allowed the empire to send some forces across the boundary or ask them for help. Either way, the emperor at the time was a chap known as Frederick III. Now, whether Frederick was the sole emperor at this time is a little bit under dispute in the law. There's a lady called Ophelia who kicks off a religious war in the empire around this time with those devoted to Ulrich staying and sort of crowning their own emperor and those devoted to the new cult of Sigmar kind of doing their own thing. This would eventually lead into an era known as the Age of the Free Emperors, which is an age of civil war within the empire that lasts for uh, many, many years. But the problem is at this point, I'm not 100% sure whether that war has started or it's kind of just on the verge of starting. But whatever the case is, the unrest in the empire is to such a level that Frederick III cannot allow an actual imperial army to be sent officially. So what he says, he puts the word out to all his nobles, said, if you guys want to send some troops and some things to go and help out Britonia with this noble cause, by all means go, but I can't send any official army. So really, it's just up to you knights. Anyone who can afford their own arms and horse and wants to go to war, I won't stop you. But if you're sort of in the militia or actually a registered soldier of the empire, you guys are sticking with us. We need you on the front line still because this is a very uncertain time for the empire. So a lot of knights with their sort of independently wealthy knights go across and say, okay, Britannia, we'll come and help you out. And so the empire reinforcements march in. Now... They take Jafar a little bit by surprise. He's not expecting any kind of retaliatory force because he's thinking Estalia weren't, didn't really have any kind of official alliance with Britonia. I should be fair enough to sort of sweep this country aside and, you know, I'll have some time after that to establish a power base there. But nope, the Empire and Britonia march against them. Having never really encountered heavy horse cavalry charges before, the Arabian army is kind of forced to pull back. They can't meet this force in open combat, particularly in the old world where the terrain and things like that favor them. This is coupled with the fact that the fleet that Jafar had sent round to Dabaro had encountered a much more fearsome resistance than they had met at Magrita. The Tabarans knew that Jafar was coming this time, they weren't taken by surprise, and had set up very sturdy defenses, managing to shallow their harbor so that any ships coming in with enemy troops couldn't quite get in there, they couldn't unload troops enough, and they could kill them off bit by bit. And eventually, the fleet that was sent to Tabaro to take it was run down and defeated. So that eliminated a significant branch of Jafar's army. And then faced with the heavy horse charges of the joint Bretonian and Empire cavalries, he was forced to retreat that branch as well. Now this brought them to their only foothold on the old world as it stood of Magrita. So Jafar says, we can't face them here. We, I'm going to retreat back to Araby. Surely they won't follow us. But one of his emirs, a chap known as Amir Vazir, later to be known as Amir the Cruel, says, no, I'm going to hold Magrita for you, Sultan. Don't you worry. Now, when they were retreating out of the lands of Estalia, they really did a whole scorched earth policy. They burned fields and crops and took as many people with them as they could as slaves. So having done this, Jafar's like, okay, good luck to you, Amir. I'm out and retreats back to Araby. So the Bretonian and Empire forces get to Magrita and they're like, oh, th these defenses have been set up very well. We will struggle to overtake this city. So what should we do? At that point, they agree to split the army. There'll be some troops who stay and surround Magrita and begin to siege it, and others will go across to Araby, and that's what they do. So they go across the sea, gathering all the spare ships they can from the old world to transport their enormous forces across the ocean, and they make landfall at the city of Kofur. They proceed to ransack it, 
and this kicks off a number of clashes around this area with the Arabian forces. The Arabian forces are largely made up of a lot of fast cavalry, not weighed down by heavy metal because the climate of Araby doesn't really suit that kind of fighting. So they begin a series of clashes around this area, just fighting for supremacy and hit and run tactics uh, employed by the Arabian forces, playing very much to their advantage. Now, Jafar was counting on the Empire and Bretonians with their heavy armor, being ill-equipped to fight a desert fight, just giving up after a little while and going home. That was his thinking. It was the climate that was going to beat them. But he underestimated the kind of fervor that the Bretonian and Empire troops had been put under to really, you know, fight for their homelands against these, well, for lack of a better word, against these infidels who aren't us, they're the other kind of idea, so let's get them, it's the Crusades, plus they took all the Estallions, let's liberate the Estallions, we'll show them how it's done. So, this takes everyone by surprise, and after a while, after a, new, a number of sort of defeats or hit-and-run tactics, no clear victories coming through for the Arabians, the fact that Jafar had really ruled his kingdom with an iron fist and had indentured people to him and didn't really reward him, and it was very much more under the lash than them loving Jafar and wanting to follow him, a number of his forces began to desert, and he ended up held up at the city of Al Haik to the northeast of Kofur. Now, knowing the way his troops were made up, he was like, I can't meet these guys in a siege situation. Their heavy armored knights coming over the wall would be a big problem for us. We don't really have a lot of armored units that can deal with them. What are we going to do? And it's like, we have to meet them in open combat. Our swift riders, we'll just run around them, we'll pepper them with arrows, we'll eventually whittle them down in the heat. And that leads to the Battle of Al Haik, which is here. And they have a fierce battle, and the Arabian horsemen are trying to do their best, but the thunderous charge of the Bretonian cavalry with the Empire Knights heavily armored with barding and lance, riding down vast swathes of this Arabian army, splattering the ground and dyeing it red, which is the color this area of Araby has remained to this day, with the amount of blood spilt, the Arabian forces just quickly collapsed. Jafar himself was killed by a lance in the back, and that was the end of Jafar's rule. Magrita, however, held out for reportedly another seven years, or six years at this point, and it took the Empire and Britannian forces a long time to whittle them down. Indeed, a group of Empire Knights at the final fall of Magrita, about 60 of them, were cornered, completely surrounded by Amir Vizier and his Black Scimitar Guard, which was his elite fighting force, all looked lost. They looked to be completely overwhelmed. When the earth shook and a statue of the goddess Myrmidia collapsed on top of the Black Scimitar Guard and Amir Vizier, crushing them to death and saving the life of the 60-odd knights who had gathered in the square, from that day on, they swore to worship that goddess, despite the fact she was not an imperial goddess, and those knights became the founding members of the Knights of the Blazing Sun, who exist in the Empire to this day. Back in Araby, while this siege was still closing off, the Crusaders spent the next hundred years, really, going around adventuring, looting, raiding the lands of Araby, from time to time holding certain cities, letting them be run by sultans still, there was really a lot of exchanging of territory and cities amongst the nation of Araby at the time with the crusading powers. They also took a lot of gold, a lot of riches, a lot of new exotic things they'd see like animals, and a lot of the crusading knights from the empire started new knightly orders with the riches they found in Araby at the time. Amongst these perhaps most famously are the Knights Panther who took a liking to the Panthers in the region. Such was the influence of the Empire during this stage that they actually started a place that remains an imperial city to this day, known as Sudenburg. And that is located just off the bottom of this map, but we'll have a look at that in a little bit. But just to let you guys know that they did found this city. But after a hundred years, the Empire and Britonia decided that the lands of Araby were too hot and too hostile to hold in perpetuity, and so eventually retreated back home to their own lands. 
During this time, while they were crusading around Araby, the island of Sartosa was also liberated from Arabian control and now falls really more under the control of just the general pirates who live there rather than any of the old world uh, nations as it were. Tilia probably still has the strongest claim however. So moving on, let's have a look at the geography of Araby itself. Obviously a very dry, a very hot country, but it kind of splits into different geographical zones. A point to sort of focus on here as we look at these geographical regions is the Bay of Corsairs, and out of that bay comes a river known as the Serpent River because the twin tongues it has at its end. Now north of the Serpent River, we have the sort of most fertile lands of Araby, the most densely populated area of Araby, and where most of the Arabian cities are located. Now, although it is still dry and hot here, you can grow crops and maintain them. So that's why this area is probably the most populated part of Araby as a nation. South of the Serpent River is much more dry, much more arid, much harder to grow things. And this area has really become the home of a lot of the nomadic tribes of Araby. And they tend to wander around this region, not really being able to settle. The land isn't fertile enough, but it allows them to survive in it nonetheless. As well as the nomadic tribes, there are also a number of mystical communities who tend to live in this area as well. Now, east of both of these zones is, of course, the desert of Araby, and that is a very hostile area. There are the odd oases scattered here and there that people can live in or just stop off at for some water as they traverse the Great Desert, but really a rather inhospitable place altogether. But that aside, let's take a look at some of the cities of Araby, and let's start with the capital, Le Sheikh. Now, Le Sheikh is the home of the Great Sultan, the leader of Araby, and it's also the headquarters of its navy, its militaristic navy, as well as its pirating fleets, which tend to exist out of here, thus Le Sheikh being also known as the City of Corsairs, based out of the Bay of Corsairs. Now, as well as being a prime navy spot, it also houses one of the elven outposts. That relationship that has served them since ancient times with the elves continues to this day, and they continue good diplomatic relations. Moving on from the Sheik, we have Kofur, where the Crusaders first made landfall. This has now become the center of the spice trade of Araby. So a lot of wealth is transferred at this port, concentrating mainly around the trade and manufacture of spices in the area. But this too, being quite an important port city, has an elven outpost located in it as well. Continuing north from Kofur, we have Al Haik, where Sultan Jafar made his final stand. Now, Al Haik is known as the City of Thieves, but is home to the largest trading port in Araby, presumably trading mostly with the Old World. Now, one assumes that maybe one or two boxes go missing off the backs of cargo ships in this city, thus earning it its name, but still a very important town for the Arabian nation. South of Al Haik, we have Martek. Now, Martek is a very interesting city. It's really where the source of all the mineral wealth of Araby is located. Mining out the nearby mountains, they amass vast amounts of gold, silver, iron, and manage to sustain the wealth of the city that way. The city itself is built around a rather mysterious geographical oddity, however, just known as the bottomless lake of Farzof Ar. Now, this lake has said to have dark demons or dark forces dwelling at the bottom of it, but for the most part, Martek exists around this lake undisturbed and using it as a fresh source of water. And the final city I wanted to point out, although not technically under the control of Araby, is the one I mentioned earlier of Sudenberg. They've carved out a little niche for themselves here as an imperial colony, still very much loyal to the empire, but something just pointing out that's an interesting aspect of the landscape in this part of the world. Now, just a quick word on the people of Araby themselves. They are very devout, whether it be to uh, Ormazd, or indeed, as the old books put it, to Alar, but they are set in their monotheistic ways, 
and they hold that true to their hearts, but they are still also very keen and expert travelers, adventurers, traders, and although science has held them back in terms of their study of gunpowder and how to make use of it in the ways of warfare, they have made huge advances in the areas of medicine, poetry, art, and of course seafaring because that is one of their key traits. But all in all, the people of Araby are, as I said, a very devout people committed to their nation and to their god. Moving on from the people of Araby, we have the armies of Araby. Now, in this uh, section, guys, I'm doing this slightly differently from some of my other army lists that I've gone through in Total War Warhammer, or indeed in what we might expect in Total War Warhammer 2. And we are going to take for the first bit of this army list the units listed in a game known as Warmaster. Now, Warmaster is the game, is the only game that Graham's Workshop have made that gave a full army list for Araby. And it's closely related to Warhammer Fantasy Battle, but the idea of Warmaster was to pick up the scale a little bit. So they made smaller models that sort of played in for many more troops. And the idea is to have mass warfare rather than what could be at times perceived as smaller skirmishes that Warhammer Fantasy Battles would represent if you took one model, meaning one unit, that kind of thing. So that's why Warmaster was developed. So we're going to go through that army list strictly, and then after that, we're going to go through some of the more conceptual units that Araby has, the ones that are mentioned in the lore, but were never given a place on their army list in Warmaster. So we'll go through some of the extra options that Creative Assembly might have at their disposal in terms of fleshing out the army list from Warmaster that was given by Games Workshop. So let's have a bit of a look at it, shall we? Starting off with the Spearmen of Araby. Now the spearmen of Araby are equipped with tall spears and shields, they're very well disciplined, they're also equipped with a curved sword, and they tend to be the real sort of police, the vanguard of the civilized goings on in any Arabian city. They guard the ports, they guard the cities, and they very much act as a garrison unit of very well disciplined troops who have made a number of vows to their masters. So that's the Spearman, and a lot of what you guys might notice going forward with some of the Arabian units is that Games Workshop has largely done a lot of medieval Middle Eastern armies previously. Not Games Workshop, sorry, excuse me, Creative Assembly have done a lot of medieval Middle Eastern armies. So they have a lot of these models, or at least references for these models around. So for a lot of the, particularly the more basic units, it shouldn't be too much of a push for them to be able to adapt them to Total War Warhammer 2. So, bearing that in mind, let's continue to go down the list of units that Araby has. So, bowmen are next. Now, bowmen we've seen, they're very lightly armored, good bows. We've seen bows in Total War Warhammer. Uh, we know what they look like. They'll probably have less range than, say, the elves, but they'll be effective bowmen nonetheless. And as I mentioned, bows are the most commonly used missile weapon in Araby. They do know of gunpowder, but it's not often used. And the reason given in some of the older texts, as I mentioned previously, was that the religious devotion stopped them from developing technology to the extent where they can mass produce firearms. But again, that is kind of countermanded by other law that says, Despite this, they've made huge technological advancement in the way of medicine. So it's a bit of give and take, perhaps, in terms of the way their technology developed. But that is the Bowman of Araby. Next up, we have the Guards. Now, the Guards are kind of the more elite infantry of the Arabian army. They're famously loyal to such an extent that if a master was to ask his Guardsmen to stab themselves right there and kill themselves on the spot, any Arabian Guardsman would do it without hesitation. Now, these are not slave troops for the most part. These are just loyal, disciplined, very able fighting men of Araby. They tend to be, despite the way these models are colored, dressed in very brightly colored cloths, much more like the chap on the right than necessarily the way the models are painted here on the left. So very brightly colored uh, guard units, and as I said, just particularly famous for being uh, very well disciplined. So they should have some particularly good leadership values, I think, in any translation over to Total War Warhammer. Next, we have the Desert Riders, very much one of the most iconic units of the Arabian army. Quick cavalry can be armed with bows or can be armed with hand weapons. They are said to be made up of the best riders, sort of best 
born horsemen of the Arabian landscape. And they are quick, they're accurate, they're deadly, they can fire in 360. It said they have a relatively short range, however, but they still can fire in 360. They're used around Araby for scouting, for patrols, for just, you know, maintaining the peace. Yeah, very much the one of the core uh, units within any Arabian army, just making them quick, making them mobile. It really is a fantastic unit that the Arabian have, very iconic and very precise and accurate as well. So that is the Desert Riders. Next up, we have the Knights, more heavily armored, not as heavily armored as, say, a Bretonian Knight or an Empire Knight, but still very fierce and they are very disciplined as well. Equipped with long lances, tall helmets, and they are just deadly, and these guys are really the hard-hitting shock cavalry, or the nearest equivalent maybe they have. I'm not sure if they were developed after the Crusade, there's maybe an answer to the knights of the old world, but the, they do have knights in the Arabian army, and they can be quite deadly, but as I said, just not as heavily armored as the knights of the old world, let's say. So moving on from the knights, we have the camel riders. Again, the Camel Riders in the Warmaster game had a couple of special rules to do with uh, issuing commands, but also the fact that camels can be quite hard-headed and difficult to control. But we've seen camels in Total War games before. Not sure how you differentiate them from uh, the horses. Maybe just make them have more shock value. Uh, maybe cause fear for things that for people that haven't seen camels before in the Warmaster game. As I said, they were they had this kind of idea of this fear self-reliance. There was concepts around issuing orders to them that made them unique to compared to desert riders or something like that but they can be armed with bows with spears as well and could be a very fun unit in total war warhammer i think you just have to differentiate differentiate them from the cavalry in some way that applies to total war warhammer one idea could be perhaps to give the camel riders slightly less attrition if they're in the desert something like that uh, maybe have the desert landscape confer some sort of penalty against all units that aren't camels. Something along those lines could maybe make them a bit distinctive as well. That's just off the top of my head. The distinctions they draw in the Warmaster game can't be really... There's no real direct translation unless you start dealing with leadership aspects and stuff like that. So just maybe giving them high or low morale. You can make an argument either way. I think maybe give them a solid charge because that'd be quite good. That's the camel riders. Camels could be mounts as well. So there we go. And also we have elephants. We've seen elephants in Total War before. It'd be great to see them in this. Maybe you'd have maybe accentuated fancy elephants. Not quite as large as the is it Oliphants in Lord of the Rings. But you know, good sized elephants. And they have missiles on the back, spears on the back. Very much fighting elephants. The elephants also in Warmaster caused terror. There were rules for stampeding in uh, the Warmaster game, and we've seen out of control elements, out of control elephant mechanics in Total War before. So it would be quite easy for Creative Assembly to transfer that over to keep that true to Total War Warhammer as they have done in many of their war games before. But elephant cavalry would be really your kick ass cavalry for any Arabian army be fantastic to see them and uh, great to have them around. So there we have the elephants. Now let's move on to some of the more interesting units. So we have the flying carpet and it'd be great to see a bunch of flying carpets going around the Warhammer world in Total War Warhammer and on the battlefields. The idea of carpets, I'm going to get into magic in Araby a little bit later, but the idea of the carpets is that in spiral patterns on these tapestries, the mages of Araby have managed to trap or coax or do a deal with air spirits, air elementals, and they've woven them into the fabric of the carpets themselves, propelling them along magically. And on those carpets, you get bowmen, you get spearmen. You can have a, you can have it both ways. You can maybe have, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but a melee carpet and a skirmishing carpet, and that's what you could have uh, going around the battlefield. They could, they really have a lot of flexibility as far as the flying carpets go. 
and it'd be really cool to see them. You'd probably see them more as a skirmishing because a carpet's not going to do you a lot of favors in close combat, one can't imagine. So, yeah, maybe more of a skirmishing unit than necessarily one for close combat. And then we have the Jin, the genies as we know them. And that they are a great unit. Now, the idea of the Jin is that on the Warmaster game, they're kind of a mount for mages. And the Jin, when it wants its master to get about, does a little bit of a whirlwind and it sweeps up its master in a whirlwind and that's how it gets about the battlefield. So it'd be really fascinating to see a unit when in locomotion then essentially becomes a vortex spell in their own right. That would be a fascinating mechanic, but you'd have to have them be able to take damage. That's the thing. So it'd be a vortex spell, but if you still hit it, it would be taking damage. Maybe with some physical resistance thrown in there when it is in the vortex form. But that would be great to see. This mount gives you... You move when it's, when you stop moving, you're not a vortex anymore and you take damage normally. But if you keep it in motion and they keep moving around as a vortex, uh, that would be absolutely fantastic to see. And something very unique to the Warhammer world and Total War Warhammer as well, I think the Jinn could provide. The Jinn also gives a bonus to one of the magic spells of Araby, which we'll get into in just a little bit. But it gives a buff to the spell Curse of the Jinn, and it makes that easier to cast. So maybe make that a bound spell, perhaps, for anyone who has the Jinn mount. It's not really a mount, but it kind of it plays as a mount, so it's a bit strange that way. But that is the, the Jinn for you. Something really unique and something that could be really fun in Total War Warhammer. Next up, we have the Commanders. And really, there's only two types of Commander for the Arabian Army. There's the Magic User... And there's the Sultan, or uh, it's very rare for Sultans. Sultans tend to be fat and bloated and hang around their harems and not really send their armies into war. The only Sultan that does really is the Great Sultan when he's leading a huge host of Arabian forces into war. But usually it's an Emir or a Sheikh, and I just represented that by the chap in the middle. So the Sultan chap on the right, less likely to go into battle. So really it'll be the Sorcerers, or the sheikhs or emirs or whatever rank is lower than a sultan leading troops into battle. Now these guys have a few interesting options for mounts themselves. I said the sorcerers can use the jinn as a mount or they can go on a camel or an elephant or even some of the Arabian heroes can use magical rope as a mount. Now I tried, I dug around, I couldn't find any rules for the rope. But I love the idea of the kind of snake charmer letting the hero go up on a rope. I just thought that was fascinating. As you can see, the hero on the left has like a Gisele sniper gun that he uses. So if you could have the hero on a rope act as a kind of sniper hero, that would be fascinating to see. And then you could have people charging him. But I like the idea, as you see the camels, you could actually have a whole unit of camels like that, I think. That would make them very distinctive from the horse cavalry. But, you know, just something to make them slightly different from the cavalry the Arabian army already has. And the elephant, you know, just slightly more elaborately decorated to hold a commander there. But that would be a lovely little upgrade chain of mounts. Magic rope to camel to elephant. I think that would be fantastic to see for the commanders of the Arabian army. The rope is a weird thing that I would love to see happen if you want your sniper to get up high. Maybe like a flying mode toggle. You can move him around. He has to come down from the rope, but you can move around, set him up, get him up on the, there with a Giselle sniper rifle or some kind of bow or something like that. He gets on his rope, has a clearer line of fire. That would be hilarious and a fun little thing to see. But those are the Arabian commanders of Warmaster. Now, moving on from Warmaster itself, that sort of brings the official army list to a close, as has been written in the Warmaster game. And we're moving on now to more conceptual stuff that's mentioned in the lore of Araby, and that Creative Assembly could maybe add to, you know, broaden out this troop roster a little bit. Although there is great stuff in there. The genies, the magic ropes, the camels, the elephants... All stuff I would love to see in an Arabian army. But here are some of the army concepts, stuff that isn't in that Warmaster army, but is mentioned elsewhere in the lore of Araby. So in terms of some of the potential heroes, in as we mentioned that the Warmaster heroes were slightly limited, but as for potential heroes of Araby, there's the idea of maybe the Sheikh who's lower than an Emir, I think. And so the Sheikhs could be a hero as you're kind of training up, melee focused hero you'd also have sorcerers as a hero as well 
you'd have potentially assassins because there is the rich history of assassins within the Middle East, the Hassassins, and they could easily play into it. And with the ties that sort of ancient Araby had with Skaven, you could argue that the Skaven taught some of the Arabian more skilled soldiers how to be assassins, and they themselves learnt it from Nippon. So that would be a nice little translation across. You could have just straight up assassins in the Arabian army. And you could also have priests of Ormazd, the one god of the Arabian people. Now I have seen rules for this priest, but as I mentioned earlier in the video, I'm really lacking in actual citations for the god Ormazd. If you guys know, do drop it in the comments. I'd love to see it. But it's mentioned around, and I've seen the copy for the priest somewhere that I imagine it's written in one of the earlier books I couldn't track down that give role-playing uh, character stuff in terms of priests. But I have seen rules for the priests, and they have a couple of really fun abilities. Some of their abilities are more general skills that have been attributed to them, such as uh, doing damage against undead, but the ones that are very unique to their worship, with uh, Ormazd being the old Nekakaran god of the sun, and being very much tied to the concept of the sun, is the Sun Spear, which is a projectile spell, is a projectile beam that is fired from the priest and does flaming damage, and the Flaming Scimitar, which is a buff which gives any unit it's cast on a buff to having flaming attacks rather than just normal attacks. So that would be fantastic to see from that priest. And those would be some great hero units potentially for the Arabian army. Moving on, we have the infantry. Now, I've just picked a couple of images here that I thought summed up the units I was talking about. These aren't official Games Workshop images. But I like the idea of the Black Scimitar Guard as kind of elite guard. And on the left is kind of how I maybe imagined they'd play with spear and sword and shield. Maybe getting both, as, as this elite unit, maybe getting a both anti-infantry and anti-large bonus being equally adept at fighting both. I like that idea, maybe give them something unique, but it's also carrying on that tradition from that unit that existed during the Crusades, and that would be kind of fun. In the top middle here, in the War Master Manual, they talk about guards, who I mentioned earlier, and how they're loyal, but they also gave a number of different types of guard that exist. And amongst those were mentioned the Dread Daughters of Tariq. Now, I saw this model image pop up in my sort of research, and I thought, that's fantastic. They would be great for the Dread Daughters. It's kind of more of a frenzying unit, a more attacking focused unit, maybe kind of an equivalent of a war dancer or a flagellant, something like that. But that could be the Dread Sisters and they would be a fantastic unit to add to the Arabian army. Now, in the Arabian army, and particularly in some of the older texts, there's definitely eunuch guards mentioned who are trained warriors, not really just slave warriors either. So I took an image of the Unsullied here from the uh, Songs of Ice and Fire, and it would be very similar to that, just very disciplined troops, but unlike the Songs of Ice and Fire, these guys aren't only compromised of slaves. So they're kind of free men who aren't who chose to be eunuchs or became eunuchs, whatever the story is, and they're disciplined fighters, and they could be spearmen or maybe even make them halberdiers because they don't necessarily need a shield, so they're just going in there with a halberd straight up, trying to cause as much damage as they can, having little regard perhaps for their own lives. So that's a take you could have for the eunuchs, who are often spoken about in some of the Arabian lore. And on the right, this is meant to represent the dervishers. Now, dervishers are often spoken about and do exist in our world as well. In our world, dervishers are, I wouldn't go as far as fanatics, but quite devout uh, religious figures. And in Turkey, and they participate in a practice known as the, I think it's the Suf tw Sufi twirling. And it would be fantastic to see these spinning, frenzying fanatics as they're described in the Warhammer world, just with two blades in hand, twirling incessantly, much like the fanatics in the Greenskin army. And that would be something fantastic to see in Warhammer, a very interesting unit that just has this kind of fantastic twirling animation we're doing a deadly dance of blades. And they're said to be in the Warhammer world, religious zealots, and that's how they operate. So that's the dervishes. These are some units that are all mentioned in Araby lore, and it'd be fun to see them translated in some way, shape, or form into Total War Warhammer. Next up, we have some beasts that could add to the army, 
Now, we mentioned that the flying carpets, because it's a carpet, can't really help out much in melee combat. But another creature that's spoken about a bit in the Araby lore is giant vultures. Now, these do play a part as carrion in the Tomb King's army. And I'm not, I think they're maybe, I can't tell if they're dead vultures or just straggly looking vultures. I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head with the Tomb King army. But you can have very much the living vultures being more melee focused flying mounts in Total War Warhammer for Araby. The idea that they're, they've been tamed and they're able to go into combat and they've had Beastmasters looking after them. And the same with leopards. It'd be great to, instead of having dogs or something like that, to have leopards or panthers, if you will, being part of the Arabian army. Obviously, with the Knight's Panther playing a part in Arabian history, the panthers very much being a creature that exists in that part of the world, it'd be great to see panthers and giant vultures play a part in any Arabian army we see coming out of Creative Assembly. Now on to some possible legendary lords in the Arabian army. Now for this, I've drawn mostly from the few named characters who have something to do with Araby in the Warhammer world as it currently stands. If I've missed any, I've apologized, but Araby lore is very spread out all over the place and it's hard to put it all together. So if I have missed any, please do drop it in the comments uh, and let fellow viewers know uh, if there are other fun units out there they should look into. But the ones I've drawn up is the Great Sultan. Now, I'm not 100% sure who the Great Sultan is in Araby at the moment. I couldn't dig out that piece of information. The fan book has him named as some kind of derivation of Saladin, of course. And I don't know if that's official from Games Workshop, but it's a fun idea that the Great Sultan at the current is like, you know, a play on the name Saladin, and that's who it is. But the Great Sultan is definitely the leader of the faction. He'd have to be. But that's who the Great Sultan is. But you could get away with not making it the Great Sultan. The idea that the Sultans are too busy gorging themselves and playing with their harems. So, could be, could be not the Great Sultan. As I said, I'm not 100% sure who that is by name at this stage in Arabian history. Next up, we have Al Mukhtar and Ahmed Shifti. Or Sheikh Ahmed Shifti, shall I say. Now, this gets us into the Regiment of Al Mukhtar's Desert. At dogs, which is a regiment of renown in the Dogs of War army of Total War Warhammer. Now, I've stipulated before we may see Dogs of War as an army book be introduced in Total War Warhammer 2, but they could skip out Al Mukhtar's Desert Dogs in order to place them as one of the legendary lords for the Arabian army. Now, the story of Al Mukhtar is quite a fun one. So, Al Mukhtar is actually the guy you see in the top right. And Al Mukhtar, just as a point of reference, is really the Warhammer world's. I guess maybe Lawrence of Arabia is the closest thing I could draw a comparison to. So the chap in the top right there was born with the name Werner Gluck. Now Werner Gluck was sent away by his wealthy parents to an exclusive school in Marienburg where he had a truly lonely and deeply sad childhood. He was often beaten by his fellow pupils, often beaten by schoolmasters. Really, he spent his entire day in anticipation of getting beaten up by somebody. So one assumes that he was a very odd child growing up. But whilst he was suffering through these beatings and batterings from pupils and teachers alike, he really set his mind far afield to the idea of global travel and seeing different parts of the world and really just escaping the life he currently had. So many years later, this very now burly, strong, hardened man steps off a ship at Le Chic. And while unloading from the ship, as often happens on the harbour, he is inundated by bag handlers and beggars and children really trying to pick your pocket. But in perfect Arabian, he tells them all to bugger off and leave him alone. They're a bit in shock about this. This is the first old worlder they've ever seen who actually speaks their own tongue. And they disappear off this group of like pickpocket children. And they start to, you know, spread whispers. Is this the Al Mukhtar, the outsider who was spoken of in prophecy? But these kids all disperse off and, you know, Werner starts to explore around the city a bit. And he gets to hear rumors of, you know, buried treasure out in the desert and ruined cities that are there to be explored. And he puts together a bit of a contingent with some of his money, an exploration party, if you will, and launches out into the desert itself. It's not long, however, before he gets a bit too deep into the desert and he is set upon by a band of mounted bandits. 
and fairly promptly his entire bag crew and the people he'd hired run away, all except for the blind beggar boy who had been enlisted to help carry his bags, who seemingly in a just bout of madness and bravery seemed to charge right towards the bandits coming towards them. Now, it wasn't revealed until later that he was just blind and didn't know what direction he was running in, but from uh, Werner's point of view, it looked like an insanely brave thing to do, and he took a bit of a liking to the boy thereafter. Werner himself did not run and faced off against the bandits, where he was promptly captured and bound. Now, the leader of this bandit, and the leader really of his clan of nomads, of which the bandits were part of, was Sheikh Ahmed Shufti. Now, the Sheikh, you know, it was, you know, it was just doing a bit of robbing of a, a, an old worlder. It's not really an Arabian. It doesn't really matter too much. I'll just be a bandit and take whatever this guy has. And he very much sort of, you know, sets himself around the idea of the beggar boy is not much. We'll just lock the beggar boy up. But this guy, we're going to, you know, beat him a bit and torture him to death while we sit around and eat his camel. Because, you know, we're a bit hungry, nothing else to do. We'll amuse ourselves. And so they spent the next three days torturing and battering Werner. But Werner did not once scream out in pain. And this began to kind of freak out the bandits. They're like, what kind of man is this? You can put up with this level of suffering. And during all of these three days, Werner's mind is constantly set back to all the hardship he'd endured before as a child that really prepared him for this amount of pain and battering. He remembers particularly an incident when he was hung upside down from the chimney of his schoolmaster by his fellow pupils, and he didn't make a noise the entire time, even when the schoolmaster lit a fire in the fireplace below, Werner still was stoic and solid in his silence and resolute suffering, and so was kind of very well prepared for what was happening to him at this point. Now, Werner had, around the camp, heard a lot about these whispers of this al muqtar this word he didn't really recognize despite the fact he spoke the language fluently he'd never really heard it before and he just hears whisperings about it around camp now for the bandits themselves what had been happening is you know increasing talk seemingly originating from the beggar boy himself has spoken about al muqtar and knowing the prophecy the bandits were like, could this be him? Could this really be him? He does seem to have some kind of magic stoicism. There is some mystic, something mystic about him being able to take all this pain. And that's why they're bringing it up around him. But they also had things going missing. And they think that these items going missing is the curse of Al Mukhtar. That if they are punishing this chosen one, this one of legend, then of course they're suffering from this curse and many of their precious items are going missing. But even Werner has his suffering limit. It. And after three days of being battered, maybe out of sheer frustration than necessarily the pain itself, and he keeps hearing this word he doesn't understand, and he just screams it at the top of his lungs, Al Mukhtar! At which point, they think this is him claiming to be Al Mukhtar, so all the bandits drop to their knees and promptly set him free, begging for his forgiveness as Al Mukhtar. Now, really, if you ask me, what had been going on is that this blind beggar boy is a bloody genius who managed to save the world. Werner, or Werner as it would be because he is from the old world and managed to save Werner and really get him established in the minds of these bandits as Al Mukhtar. From that day forward all the bandits including Sheikh Ahmed Shifti were like okay Al Mukhtar you, lead, you join our party and will become one of the fiercest fighting forces but please forgive us. Werner, liking the idea of running around the deserts of Araby as a bandit, was like, okay, cool, no, you guys are good. And they go around together and have forged a very powerful reputation as just a hugely effective fighting force of fast-moving cavalry around the world of, and around Araby in particular. And it wasn't long before their reputation became such that the Sultan of Lashik, so in fact, at that time, the Great Sultan, because that's where the Great Sultan is based, employed al Mukhtar and the desert dogs to launch a campaign against the undead they did that successfully and al Mukhtar eventually got bored and decided to steer the fighting party up north where they made a name for themselves in the border princes as well so a almost world famous fighting force became al Mukhtar and his desert dogs as you can see here in the models we have on the left al Mukhtar 
Next to him is Sheikh Ahmed Shufti. And next to him is Ibn, the blind beggar boy who carries the banner for the regiment. They also always have a horn blower, you know, just to keep spirits up. And that's what makes up Al Mukhtar's Desert Dog unit to this day. There's still all the characters there. Now, as a regiment, they also have a couple of magic items. The first is the scimitar of Daisis, Daisir. And that is the scimitar handed down as a family heirloom from the sheikh of the nomad clan that most of the desert dogs come from. So this is a magic weapon that in the tabletop does magical damage and increased strength. So increased weapon strength and magical damage. But that is the blade of Ahmed Shifti, the sheikh of the desert dogs. And the other weapon is the banner, known as the Black Banner, held by Ibn. And that has rules on the tabletop, but really effectively gives them a good morale buff when going into combat. So Al Mukhtar himself doesn't have any magical items, and one could argue he's maybe more of a symbol than necessarily the leader, because, you know, Sheikh Ahmed Shufti still kind of in charge. They kind of maybe actually Al Mukhtar's in charge and Sheikh's his right hand man. But he could be introduced as a legendary lord now to put on my uh let's call it just for the sake of this is the internet and this is how people talk on the internet my social justice warrior hat the, we might not see al Mukhtar be made the legendary lord of araby and maybe in fact they might make sheikh ahmed shufti the leader because the story of al Mukhtar is very much that old colonial tale of you know White man goes to a place, white man becomes the best at being, in this case, a desert raider, or, you know, you guys have seen the story previously, a samurai or a general, and then ends up leading all the people into ways they could never lead themselves, which is a very old kind of colonial tale that might not play so well in today's political dynamic. So Creative Assembly might veer away from that slightly. But Al Mukhtar is a fun character and could be a legendary lord. Equally, I'd be happy with Sheikh Ahmed Shifti. He does have the magical sword after all, not Al Mukhtar. And so he could equally be the legendary lord in the Arabian army if you wanted to. Maybe play it that they're going around before Al Mukhtar turned up. So that's my thinking on Al Mukhtar and the Desert Dogs as a potential legendary lord unit for the Arabian army. Next up, we have the Golden Magnus. Now, if Al Mukhtar or Ahmed Shifti played the melee focused uh, legendary lord then the golden magnus would be the magical focus legendary lord now the golden magnus is a character that doesn't necessarily appear on warhammer fantasy battle tabletop he appeared in a naval focused game known as dreadfleet and if you guys haven't seen my video on that do check it out in the top right hand corner because some of the models for ships that came out with dreadfleet are pretty amazing and there's some fantastic stuff that goes on uh, in that game, uh, both lore-wise. But this is as good as opportunity as any to speak about magic in Araby. So magic in Araby is very different. The concept being that the two poles are so far apart from Araby, where all chaos energy comes from and all magic comes from, that Araby isn't really a place that geographically lends itself to magic very well. So that could play out in Total War Warhammer in the idea that maybe Winds of Magic are quite low there. But what magically attuned people in Araby have learned to do is to actually communicate with elemental spirits. Now, in some of the old lore, it says that some people in Araby even worship these elemental spirits, but they found ways to manipulate them, even trap them at times. And this is how a lot of the magic in Araby gets done. So we've seen the uh, jinn earlier be captured, and we've spoken about how the flying carpets have wind spirits trapped in them that allow them to fly. So a lot of Araby magic is based around this idea. And Araby, in fact, has its own lore of magic, and I'm going to go into some of the spells they have now. So a wizard from Araby will have these four spells available to them. The first is Sandstorm, slightly self-explanatory, but the wizard conjures up air spirits to just kick up a massive sandstorm, and that's a debuff, and it's a debuff around the sorcerer himself. That's how it's limited to in the Warmaster game. But one could translate that across to that being applicable as a casting debuff spell if you wanted to at Creative Assembly. The next one is Mirage, and I think this could be one of the funnest, most interesting spells in Total War Warhammer for Araby. 
So the idea is that the wizard conjures up uh, spirits or something to trick your mind into seeing a fierce band of warriors in front of you. Now in Warmaster, the way this played was that this band of warriors conjured up as an illusion couldn't move. Any missile units within range had to fire at that unit rather than any other unit. And whenever you went into close combat, that would be the end of the unit. Now, I don't necessarily like that implementation in Total War Warhammer. Instead, what I think would be fantastic is if you were able to summon, it would work very much like zombies do for the undead. So you summon the magic illusion, it appears in front of an enemy army, but it, here's the trick. It can't do any damage and it can't take any damage, but like all summoned units, it goes down over time, the health bar. But maybe double the speed of this one compared to other units like the zombies or any of the other summoned units we get in Total War Warhammer at the moment. So it lasts less amount of time, but can't take any damage and can't do any damage. So the idea is that it's a spell that just ties up an enemy unit for a certain amount of time. They just get entangled in combat that they can't necessarily escape from without trouble and they just can't get away but they still think these are real warriors so they continue fighting them and tactically that would be a very interesting spell to have for any arabian army so that's my thoughts on that one and the third spell is one called sunstrike and this is one that would look great in the game where any Arabian sorcerer sum summons energy from the nearby maybe fire spirit into them and then projects it from their eyes. So it's literally like laser eyes of sun energy that spew out much like a projectile magic spell doing flaming damage and that would be that's called sunstrike and that would be a fantastic spell to see in total war warhammer the last one is one i mentioned when we were speaking about the jinn and that is the curse of the jinn which is a debuff that essentially makes armor worse so it's an armor debuff effectively we've seen them in total war warhammer before not terribly interesting but if you had the jinn as a mount or an accompanying unit it would be very interesting to have him have that as a bound spell rather than one that required the winds of magic. So that would be fun as well as them being the moving vortex that they are. So those are the spells of Araby. So any Golden Magnus would hopefully have those spells. But as for the Golden Magnus himself, the Golden Magnus himself is a very mysterious character said to be rich beyond measure, eccentric to the extreme, and has given himself a number of titles, including the Sultan of the Seas, and, well, Golden Magnus is a fairly extravagant name in its own right, no one's really sure where he came from. Some have said that he's an exiled patriarch of the Colleges of Magic, who's lived an extraordinary long time, but no one really knows what is going on with him. However, one thing is known for certain, he's a very devious character, and is infamous in gambling dens across the Arab world and the Old World itself for, you know, being fairly nefarious at the old gambling game. If you were to see him, he'd be very elaborately dressed in bright silks, and it's said he's covered his skin in some kind of golden powder to give him this extra golden gleam. But if you were to see him in combat, he is extremely lethal, very quick, particularly for a man who looks his age, and he has a magical item known as the Ever-Burning Blade, which is a scimitar blade that's always on fire. Now, he lives mostly on his enormous pleasure barge, which is pictured here, and I'm not sure if you get the idea of scale, but those, yeah, little doors and windows on the front bit there give you an idea of how huge this thing is. Now, he has his harem on this pleasure barge, along with a lot of other interesting uh, things, chief amongst which is maybe some clockwork thunder tusks. Now, we've not seen Thunder Tusks in Total War Warhammer as of yet, but they are essentially huge horned beasts, often ridden by ogres in the Warhammer world, but he's said to have these clockwork ones, so one assumes mechanized Thunder Tusks, which could be absolutely devastating. On his ship, it's essentially a maze of corridors and all kinds of oddities, but he's said to have this room that's just ranks upon ranks of jars, and in each one of these jars, 
is an elemental that he's trapped or ensnared somehow. And at each one of these jars, you can break and command the elemental to do one thing. So a wind elemental, you command it to blow in a certain direction. And once it's fulfilled that one command, it disappears off. But he has so many of these. He has a nearly unending supply of elementals he can use. Now on the high seas, he uses these to wage war, to move quickly. He gets air elementals to fill his sails fire elementals to burn down other enemy ships and can be particularly devastating in this way but one assumes he's a master of all types of arabian magic he also employs sea nymphs or sea elementals to push his ship along and even get it to move even faster there are some deep mysteries about this character however and on the ship there are said to be three great urns similar to the smaller jars but just massive and covered in spirals of skulls and it's said that these jars were thought to have belonged to Nagash himself and each house an ungodly evil but ones that have not been unleashed upon the world as of yet. Some have speculated that these large urns contain something known as royal jinn who are so powerful they would be capable of blotting out the sun itself. And it's thought that even the golden Magnus himself is terrified of these urns and what is within them and rarely if ever speaks about them and very few have even ever seen them. But in terms of how this character could be interpreted in Total War Warhammer, in the lore as I mentioned is the idea of these mechanized thunder tusks which would be amazing to see in Total War Warhammer. So you could have one of them as a mount for land battles if you get him on the ocean, give him a massive movement bonus on the ocean if he ever tries to travel over sea. And he has his magical ever-burning blade as a magical item he can have. So there we go, we've got a magical item, we've got the fact he's a skilled warrior and a very powerful mage. Give him all that great Arabian magic I mentioned earlier, and he will be absolutely fantastic as a potential legendary lord in Total War Warhammer 2. Next up, we have an oldie but a goldie, and this is the idea of Baron Odo and Suleiman. Now, Baron Odo was a Bretonian character who I've mentioned in my missing Bretonian legendary lords. Again, top right or description if you're interested in checking that out after this video. And he was around in the Crusades and went around challenging Arabian champions to a fight and then killing them whether they wanted to fight him or not. And it was only one who ever really impressed him, and that was Suleiman. And so Suleiman fought him in noble combat, did lose to Baron Odo, but Baron Odo was like, okay, buddy. You, I'm not going to kill you. And so Suleiman said, okay, how about we like ride around together? And they had many adventures around the old world. Now, because this was during the Crusades, this is obviously a long time ago. So one might assume that Suleiman is dead because you'd have to have it be Suleiman rather than Baron Odo himself as a Crusader. So you could play it that Suleiman came back after the Crusades, established himself and is a warrior still wandering the desert to this day. That's a bit stretching the law. Or you could maybe have a prodigal son situation where Suleiman the third or fifth or whatever generational number makes sense returns to Araby to reclaim his father's sheikdom uh, to take over the old nomad tribe his father was once a part of and you know go on a climb to power eventually becoming the great sultan and that would make a fascinating Arabian campaign if you ask me. But that's just one of the other heroes mentioned in old Warhammer lore that could potentially be a legendary lord for Total War Warhammer. Now these were very much a pair and they had special rules about fighting as a pair but it's just a name to throw out there as a potential legendary lord and it's probably the least likely of the ones I've mentioned already. And guys that about sums it up for our video on Araby. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Now whether we see Araby or not in Total War Warhammer 2 I have no idea. We'll definitely see the landmass but I don't know if Creative Assembly will have done the stuff to get them in. As I said though, there's a lot of units in there that Creative Assembly have effectively already made for other games in terms of light Arabian cavalry and uh, camels and elephants. There's a lot of stuff in there they have somewhere in an asset vault. Whether that is easily transferable across to Total War Warhammer, I don't know. But there's a lot in there they could jump. They could definitely skip ahead. It wouldn't take as much time as it would maybe for other stuff. But those are the armies of Araby. I really hope we get them as a separate faction in Total War Warhammer 2. So fingers crossed for that. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. As always, guys, thank you for watching. 
and a special thanks to John, Reese, Colin, Thomas, Matthias, Samuel, and Matthews, my patrons. Special thank you to you guys. And as always, again, guys, I hope to catch you on the next one.